Hello, everyone, and welcome to 15 Questions with an Archaeologist, brought to you by the National Park Service Southeast Archaeological Center. I'm Josh Guerrero, and I'm your host, and this is the show we're trying to collect as many interviews as we can, where we ask 15 questions with an archaeologist. Each podcast episode will feature one archaeologist answering the same 15 questions. I think it's going to be fun, and we just might learn something. And joining me today, I have Hannah Fromneck, who is a SEAC alum and is currently studying at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. So, Hannah, thanks so much for taking time for joining me today, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, I've been looking forward to uh, catching up with you. It's been a while since we had a chance to work together uh, in the field. I mean, goodness, I think it was back in, what, June that we were last um, slugging it out? In, I think we were in Vicksburg at the time? I think so. It was very interesting, especially, you know, uh, mid-COVID was mm -hmm. a unique experience. <laughs> Yeah, that that would be putting it mildly, um, I would say. So, all right. Well, we got a lot uh, to co to cover today, and I'm sure we'll um, take a trip down memory lane and talk a little bit more about some of your experiences uh, here at SEAC and other places that you've worked. But um, right now, just uh, tell us a little bit about what you're currently doing um, at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, well, I just moved here for my master's back in September, and I'm in the second term. I've had... Uh, the luxury during uh, the pandemic to still be able to go into my labs. And I've been learning a lot, really appreciating having um, this exposure to European archeology span since I uh, started out my so far very short career in archeology span <laughs> in the Southeast of the US. Um, so it was a lot of uh, what is very fascinating, Florida archeology. span um, But I'm, in the osteoarchaeology program right now. And I actually have my dissertation uh, topic nailed down, which I'm going to be completing over the summer. And I'll be looking at uh, treponemal disease at a local cemetery we have that I actually uh, get to walk by it every day on my way to my lab, which is uh, very fun, take a nice little stroll through there. Uh, it's, the site's called St. Nicholas Kirk, and it's a medieval cemetery that's uh, very beautiful, actually. And I'll be looking at uh, congenital and venereal syphilis at at least three individuals. So I have uh, one adult male and two infants, and then hopefully more, but it's just like everything else right now, dependent <laughs> on time and accessibility <laughs> due to COVID. So <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. But that also makes me curious to ask you uh, this next question, and that is, uh, if money were no object whatsoever, what type of archaeology would you do? Do you think you would continue on doing osteoarchaeology as you are now, or might you look into pursuing something different? I um, would absolutely still be looking at osteo. I've been obsessed with it since I first really found out about it. And um, what I've definitely come to realize, especially during my master's, is, is there are so many different techniques and methodology and approaches to um, osteoarchaeology which I just, of course, hadn't been a, um, able to look into before and wasn't knowledgeable about before. So I kind of, um, I'd like to explore all the different like ways you can look at it, such as archaeothanatology. So uh, looking at it through the lens of human decomposition and what we can learn from there to the bioarchaeology bio of care, uh, such as seen in Lorna Tilly's work. So looking at, um, sort of reading how people, indiv individuals were cared for um, by looking at the healing process and what would have been done and was evident to have been done in management of those who couldn't really take care of themselves due to some sort of injury or disability. So there's just so much to learn. So I kind of, with all the money and time, I kind of, uh, you know, jack of all trades. There's just so much that can be done and so many different angles to look at things that I'd love to just kind of experiment and play around. <laughs> yeah, it sure, it sure sounds like, yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's like you get, sounds like you have a lot of sub-disciplines within a sub-discipline of archaeology. <laughs> so. Exactly. Oh, wow. All right. Well, what I want to ask you a little bit about next is um, your education up until this point. Uh, of course, you know, you said that you're going for your master's at the University of Aberdeen right now, but what about beforehand? Uh, where have uh, you received your education and why did you choose to study at that location? 
I started out with my bachelor's. I actually have two bachelor's degrees from Florida State. I got um, a degree in anthropology and psychology at the same time, which was a lot more effort than <laughs> when I first decided to take that on. But oh, I, <laughs> um, I actually started in psychology just because I like, you know, the study of humans and trying to understand people. Um, and that was uh, before I found out that I have this passion for archaeology because it wasn't something I'd ever considered, but I just sort of um, took a class. Uh, one of my, actually our uh, former co-workers, Alison Brune, was um, a friend of mine at the time, and she suggested taking this uh, intro to biological anthropology class just as, you know, a gen ed, like, course to fulfill credits, and I absolutely fell in love. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and all the stuff you could learn about was just so fascinating. It was, it just completely took me over and I added on an anthropology major that semester, I believe. Um, and yeah, I had a wonderful experience there. Definitely um, all, all my experience up until moving here has been focused on the Southeast uh, due to uh, Florida State, which has been so much fun. And then I, for my master's, I wanted to take a I definitely want to go more into research later down the line as much as I found a love for NAGPRA at SEAC. And I hope to be able to work with uh, NAGPRA and do more repatriation work down the line, hopefully. Um, but research-wise, I wanted to look into European archaeology. And I've uh, been able to sort of scratch the surface. And it's been really fun and a bit overwhelming because I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything about it beforehand, but it's just been this wonderful experience of um, learning about all these other methodologies and techniques and customs. So it's it's been really exciting. All right, great. Now I I, I, I forget were you um, going or studying at FSU while you were working at SIEC? Um, was that around like the same time? Did they overlap? Was there some overlap there? I was. I started volunteering, oh my goodness, my junior or senior year. Um, I ended up, because I know there's a good relationship between um, like the department kind of feeds students over to SEAC to volunteer, because I started out as a volunteer um, and then I got my Nick P internship, which I held on to for, oh my goodness, at least over a year. And then finally got a GS7, which was a complete blessing. And yeah, uh, it was, so I put in a lot of lab hours in undergrad. So, um, but SIAC, I think, was one of my favorites and definitely ended up being the best opportunity with getting to learn so much and ended up my first professional experience in archaeology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so therefore, for anyone listening, you know, it's not too uncommon for people who start off as volunteers, eventually working their way up to internships and then eventually a job, just kind of like how you did. So right on. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, you mentioned that you've uh, got to spend a, a good amount of time uh, here in the Southeast studying and then, of course, working your way up through the ranks at SEAC. So um, how about you tell us a little bit about some of your experiences thus far and some of the sites that you've gotten to work to? Uh, go to. And, uh, you know, we, we brought up Vicksburg a little bit, and so I'm sure we could touch on that uh, a little bit more in depth as well. But, but yeah, you know, uh, can you tell us about some of the most interesting sites that you've gotten to work on so far? One of my absolute favorites was, uh, it wasn't my first field school, but it was my first uh, osteological, like mortuary field school. And it was in Poland at Drosko, oh, wow. uh, this small, remote, more rural um, town. And what was really interesting about the site is there were what um, can be called vampire or uh, atypical is a more accurate term, burials, where the individuals uh, were decapitated after death postmortem. And their heads in several instances were taken and placed between the legs. And we had instances of one burial had two sickles buried with it. Others had large stones place where the head was and down by the feet. So it's this, um, I know it was this uh, interaction between um, 
the newly, uh, well, fairly newly introduced uh, Christianity with uh, some uh, fear of these um, more otherworldly uh, presences that go back in before the Christianization of Poland. So it was uh, very fascinating. I hadn't seen anything like that before. And it was, I was very privileged to have that be my first experience digging. And I know actually our uh, field school, this was in 2019, we were the first um, group to have any atypical or vampire burials um, in years. They hadn't found any for quite some time. And we got, it was three or four of them uh, two of them were in beautiful um, condition, very well preserved. The first one with the sickles um, was not as well preserved, but we still had a nice outline of the individual where we could tell where the head was placed and you could see the mandible and the teeth since uh, teeth do preserve uh, quite well. So it was fascinating. Um, other than that, we had some really interesting um, like well-preserved coffins and I know we had like a pillow and socks, which were fascinating. Wow. They preserved pretty well. <laughs> um, so it was, um, that was an incredible experience. And it was definitely, um, I did a lot of crash course learning uh, on how to actually excavate uh, a burial, which was so much fun. And I always am looking forward to digging again. So that was one of my favorites. Oh, wow. Well, and I imagine, yeah, you probably picked up a lot because, I mean, this being like an atypical cemetery, especially in the way you just described, I mean, that's that's got to be a, a bit unusual. And I'm sure like uh, any cemeteries that you may come across uh, down the line probably won't be quite as complex, maybe. And I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what uh, other cemeteries um, um, are like. Uh, but now, was I don't suppose the cemetery... Um, being atypical like this, was this maybe around the time of uh, the bubonic plague? Because I think I've heard of like around the time of bubonic plague, I think it was in Italy, there was a couple of excavations where they found like uh, remains were situated in very weird ways, uh, probably because of like uh, superstitions with vampires or the undead where like bricks were in the mouths of some of the skulls that were found and everything. Was this cemetery by chance tied to that event as well? Um. I don't believe so. I know uh, the little uh, crash course we were kind of given on uh, these atypical burials is, and the reason they were called atypicals is these individuals were buried this way. They weren't dug back up after uh, any of the community or family mm -hmm. members of the individuals had any sort of um, questionable experiences or ailments afterwards, which ah, would okay. be a concern. Um, so these this happened. Um, at the time of burial, before burial. Um, but I know we talked about how it's more a mysterious nature or anything that's a bit off around this individual or their death, or just if the individual in question had any great knowledge, if they came into town without anyone knowing much about them, anyone who would die suddenly, or has any sort of um, more unique kind of possibly concerning trait doesn't have to necessarily be good or bad as again noting the just someone with m greater intelligence is the one example I always think of as being something where it's not necessarily a bad trait just something that isn't as normal or well understood gotcha okay wow that's that that's fascinating you and I might have to talk <laughs> about that a little bit more uh, offline because yeah that's very interesting really really cool <laughs> All right. So, but for my next question, though, this is going to be dialing things in a little bit. Um, you know, we talked about some sites. Let's talk a little bit about some artifacts, uh, or as we like to word this question, the coolest artifact. Uh, <laughs> if, just uh, reflecting on your experiences thus far, what do you think the coolest artifact that you've ever recovered would be? This is a bit hard just because I do uh, focus on human remains. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there's, um, I know one, uh, actually you may remember this. I don't know if you were down at the screening station when we found this, but there was a little uh, mouth harp that was recovered at Vicksburg over the summer. It's just like little like, and I had no idea what it was when we first excavated it, especially because <laughs> I had no knowledge, uh, in-depth knowledge of the Civil War that time period before <laughs> Vicksburg. Um, but it was just this really interesting little um, 
harp, like little mouth harp. That, the jaw um, harps, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, uh, one of the park rangers actually identified because we were all standing around and uh, since no one really specializes in the Civil War and Vicksburg was such an uh, interesting dynamic of a group, which was ended up being a wonderful experience. Um, it was just something that was just, uh, I don't know, a bit unique. And I thought it was, uh, uh, it was very interesting, different. Yeah. You know, actually, I think I remember someone mentioning it. Uh, someone within our crew might've mentioned it. I don't think I've seen it. Well, then of course, you know, I was like slugging buckets like left and right. So, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so I think I probably missed out on some of the finds there, but, um, but cool. All right. Right on. All right. So what I want to ask uh, you about next, I want to talk a little bit about mentorship because, you know, you and I are still fairly new to the world of archaeology. And I think we've been blessed to have some good mentors along the way to kind of help us, uh, you know, pick up some things and kind of grow in our careers. So who have been some of your mentors that you've had uh, so far and how have they influenced you along the way? Uh, There are two women uh, who stick out specifically to me. Uh, You know one of them. Uh, Dawn Lawrence uh, Mm. definitely was an incredible influence and role model for me. She was uh, my boss at SEAC, and she oversaw uh, my internship and later my position as a GS7. Uh, So it was my first real professional experience, and my first real idea outside of uh, you know, university labs and being able to understand what I was uh, hoping to do with my career. And she really, she kind of went out of her way to make sure that I was learning as much as I could and that I was getting what I wanted to out of the experience. Uh, she tried to give me advice in all realms of uh, just being a professional in like code of conduct and uh, different form, different ways of approaching osteology and what I could do with the future of my career. So it was really um, a lot of practical, valuable information, and I will forever be grateful to her for that. Um, I also have uh, here, I have the privilege of studying under my professor, Dr. Rebecca Crozier, and uh, she's an osteologist as well. She is uh, brilliant and she uh, is very patient because I ask a million and one questions. I'll come in with, I have the every day. I, I, <laughs> she's so you bring her a list. <laughs> oh, I bring her a list and I, oh, what about this? And then, oh, I have a question about this. And then after, so she'll just uh, sit there and smile and answer everything and try to give me new resources. And she just really wants everyone to learn as much as possible and really pushes us to um, be the best we can. And I've, these two women have definitely uh, helped me so much so far and I'm sure they will still in the future. So been very lucky with them. Yeah. And, and definitely a, a shout out uh, to Dawn as well, because, you know, she was uh, our uh, crew leader when we were uh, at Vicksburg and, you know, having to take a crew to do this complex project right at the start of uh, the pandemic. I mean, I could tell that, she was juggling um, a lot, but she did very well mm-hmm. with not with, with not only uh, just managing the flow of the project, but also just looking out for you know the crew as well. Because let's see, it's it, the, the, there's this virus going around. It's super hot there in Vicksburg too. So mm-hmm. just, uh, yeah, the way she went about that project, I thought was amazing. So um, you know, and unfortunately, she's now moved on from SEAC, but you know, big loss for us, but a great gain for mm-hmm. whichever agency she moved to. So right on. So Don, if you're listening, props. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, Don. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. So what I want to ask you about next, you you know, you mentioned that you've uh, had a chance to do some work in, you know, different countries around the world. Uh, You know, of course, you're in Scotland now. You did mention Poland and and then, of course, uh, in the southeastern uh, U.S. But what country so far do you think kind of handles like cultural resource management and archaeology uh, the best? Like who just seems uh, to get it? Or do you think maybe at this point you're still getting a little bit more of a feel for the way other countries do it. And you're not really sure you can make that determination yet. But anyway, um, I was just curious as to your thoughts. I, well, I definitely um, haven't been able to experience as much as I'd like to, to be able to answer that properly. Um, I haven't actually been able to do CRM in the States just because I, 
had the wonderful pleasure of, um, since I started my uh, internship and volunteering at SEAC while I was still an undergrad, uh, that carried me on up until I moved for my master's. So I didn't actually uh, work in ECRM as I had intended to. And I was hoping to <laughs> do so once I moved here, but a uh, very common phrase nowadays, uh, COVID had different plans. So I yeah, unfortunately yeah. cannot say much about it yet. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, get some experience uh, once everything opens up from this lockdown soon. So fingers crossed. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very, very good. All right. So what I want to ask you about next is I want to ask you um, a little bit about volunteers. Of course, you mentioned that you started off as a volunteer um, at SEAC and then worked your way up. But have you had the chance to work alongside like other volunteers, um, maybe either um, at SEAC or maybe even now within maybe some of the labs that you are working with uh, over there at Aberdeen? Um, I love volunteering and am clearly very fond of volunteers. Uh, volunteers are an invaluable resource to labs and yeah. any sort of like survey or excavation process. I mean, over the summer, we had the gentleman who actually worked for the Park Service, who was a veteran and helped us out with this uh, really um, important uh, Civil War site. So, um, I mean, there are from cases where like that where we needed all the hands we could get and it really helped out having someone who was so hard working alongside us and so dedicated um to just any lab work where it's i'm i mean you can't really ever thank volunteers enough i think because yeah. they're sacrificing their own time and energy uh to help out and i swear they're some of the most dedicated people <laughs> Um, it's absolutely wonderful having volunteers to work alongside. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even though sometimes uh, we like, there's parts of our job that are very, very exciting. There's also parts of our job that could be, you know, pretty tedious and tough. I mean, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we were to, like in, in Vicksburg, those buckets were heavy and we literally, <laughs> we literally filled, moved and screened over a thousand of them that that trip mm -hmm. um i wasn't counting but come on i mean it's just it had oh, to be over a would, thousand <laughs> thank you again for being the trooper who <laughs> just carried most of that literally yeah oh my um, goodness you are a lifesaver thank you uh, yeah uh and and, and also <laughs> like uh, just a fun little side note for our listeners um i that th this particular project that hannah and i are talking about this is how i got the nickname bucket man um that's, <laughs> that's sort of kind of uh stood the test of time at SEAC uh, even now <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, <laughs> before we go too far down memory lane, uh, to, to, to your point, yes, absolutely. Volunteers are amazing. And uh, we've had a couple and other projects that I've uh, been on. And uh, they're just they're just a joy to be around, too, because, you know, you can just see how passionate they are about because mm -hmm. you know, this is their cultural heritage, too, that they're working with. So it's kind of really cool to see them take that ownership and uh, and help out and kind of do their part as well. And yeah, so. 100% agree. Volunteers are amazing. So for sure. <laughs> All right. So what I want to ask you about next, and this is kind of getting into, I, I say the core of what it means to be an archaeologist. And uh, the first of those questions is, what do you think is just the best part about being an archaeologist? Um, I feel like it's something that I can uh, really experience and feel right now, which is the just a uh, myriad of possibilities to look into the past and just how many questions you can ask in trying to connect with these people from the past and trying to understand who they were, what their lives were like, what they were doing, and really trying to interpret it into a, in a way that is meaningful for people today and helping them kind of, and helping everyone, all of us, really connect with uh, our pasts and our heritage and really just shining a light on these people again. And there's just so many ways of doing this and looking at it from so many different aspects. It's, uh, I feel like a kid in a candy shop right now. There's like <laughs> so many different ways to go about it. So many different things to look at, so many different cultures, so many different places and times. There's uh, just like the whole 
all of history is just right there for your taking. And it's just an absolute pleasure and privilege to be able to study it. Okay, right, right on. And you know, I think that's actually a first, Hannah, to be to be brought up on on the podcast. You know, forming those connections uh, to the past and everything, and shining a light. I think that's the first time someone's uh, answered this question that way. So, right on. Very cool. All wow. right. <laughs> but on the flip side, though, <laughs> what would you say is the worst part about being an archaeologist? Um. Well, right now, especially after. Um, I was up until, uh, well, an extra two hours, I was up until 2 a.m. trying to submit a video presentation. <laughs> right now, I'd probably say the stress, um, but I feel like that's just across academia, more likely than not. Um, but uh, just like any other job, it can be a bit stressful. Um, sometimes you wonder if you're really doing a good enough job. So. And if you're asking the right questions. So I feel like it has, uh, just like any other career, it's um, the same sorts of um, very like human problems, but I can't, um, the job itself, I can't really think of anything. I, I love the balance of um, lab and field experience. So I don't really have any critiques about archaeology in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little bit of uh, of back and forth that way. Yes, um, I lo I love getting out in the field uh, and you know doing everything that you know we've been talking about. But then of course you know you do have the downsides of the field too. Um, I I always say that. There's no such thing as a perfect environment. Like uh, when I was down in the Virgin Islands, it's a beautiful beach location. You can see the waves and everything, but then you have um, Jack Spaniard wasps like all all around, and I'm worried about oh, getting no. <laughs> stung by a wasp. And you know, then it's really hot, and then uh, it's muggy, and uh, you know, there's mosquitoes and there's tarantulas. So, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm like, well, this is this is paradise, but is it <laughs> really? So, yeah, it, it's hard to just like find like uh, you know that the most ideal setting, but you know, it's still mm -hmm. it's, it's still tons of fun though. It's it's still it really is so. All right. Uh, so what I have for you next is, and this is a tribute to The Right Stuff, which is a wonderful novel written by Tom Wolfe. <laughs> I would like to ask you, who is the greatest archaeologist that you have ever seen? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so many great archaeologists out there who I've had the pleasure of working for, and I feel like I've learned something from every one of them, including you, absolutely. Um, Sweet. <laughs> There's, I mean, it. it's uh, your work ethic is definitely very impressive. And it's, I feel like really you can learn something from just about everyone you have the uh, pleasure of working with. Um, I guess specifically, I'd say my two men mentors I mentioned earlier, uh, Don Lawrence and Dr. Rebecca Crozier. They're both lovely people and I've definitely um, learned a lot from them. But yeah, I feel like every archaeologist is, um, has something unique and special to give themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, th this is a hard question to answer. Um, I, I agree <laughs> with you because it's like we do get the chance to work around so many amazing people, so many brilliant minds. And just to say, yeah, you all are awesome, but he or she is just a little bit more awesome. Yeah, it's kind of hard. to. We can't really do that, can we? <laughs> so. Very hard. <laughs> uh, okay, right, right on. All right. So the next couple of questions that I have for you, Hannah, these are questions that I'm sure all archaeologists have been asked at one point in time. So you're going to get asked uh, these as well. And the first of those questions is, have you ever found a dinosaur? I'm probably going to give you another uh, first answer for this. I'm a terrible um, example for answering this question because I actually worked in a paleontologist lab uh, <laughs> before I got into archaeology. <laughs> Yep, definitely was, first. <laughs> yep. Um, so this was before archaeology. I and I've always heard the whole, oh, we don't dig up um, dinosaurs. And every time I kind of sink down in my seat and try not to be conspicuous, <laughs> uh, because I did have this wonderful experience with uh, Dr. Gregory Erickson at FSU. Um, I was actually picking through for the most part <laughs> remains from this Alaskan uh, Paleoarctic site, and I found uh, several marsupial teeth. I found a theropod type A teeth, tooth, which was quite unique. And then I also, I believe it was a fragment of a pterodactyl bone. <laughs> oh, wow. 
which was fascinating. But then I also try not to bring <laughs> this kind of stuff up around um, at least the archaeologists in my life because I have a feeling I'll have someone wagging their finger at me <laughs> for being that person <laughs> to confuse everyone else. Okay. Well, well, I happen to think that it's it's pretty cool, and uh, you know, you know, actually, um, yeah, we we get this question a lot as archaeologists, and you know, I have actually kind of contemplated. You know, maybe I should go out into the field wearing a Jurassic Park T-shirt. You know, and just you know, <laughs> you know just have a little bit of fun with and, and just roll with this one. But uh, but Love yeah, it. it's uh, but that, but that's cool though. I didn't realize that you had that experience before. So right on. Uh, probably another thing you and I will have to talk about a little bit more in depth uh, <laughs> offline because you know you got me curious now. So very cool. All right, but. Moving on in our conversation, the next question that kind of goes along these same lines, uh, how do you feel about Indiana Jones? <laughs> um, oof. Has not really aged well, at least for I know, at least like Temple of Doom has some issues. <laughs> um, but apart from some of the questionable, problematic nature that's more of its time, um, I feel like it's it definitely doesn't represent archaeology as a field of study. It's definitely um, much more glamorized, uh, fast feet, uh, much more grab the artifact and go sort of scenario. Um, so, I mean, it's it's a piece of um, art, I guess you could consider it, uh, consider it, or it's in the realm of artistic, um, like, like area where... It, it has the freedom to do what it pleases. And I feel like a movie that was portraying really the archeology span as what it is would not be as, you know, um, thrilling. Or, yeah. yeah, I know something, oh God, a movie just came out. I think it's called The Dig. That was, I think it was this year. I think year. I've heard of that, yeah. I haven't watched it. N but, nor have yeah. I yet. Um, <laughs> I don't know how um, interesting that would be unless it's a particularly interesting site, which I know the dig is about a more, um, there's a lot more going on in that. So <laughs> um, it's definitely much more glamorized, but I mean, it's a movie. Yeah. I, don't know how, it, I know a lot of people came to archaeology because of it and were inspired to do archaeology because of Anuna Jones, which is good for um yeah. Adding to our numbers. <laughs> but but you're, you're absolutely right, though. I, th I think it would be hard to make a thriller out of us just meticulously scraping away at a excavation <laughs> unit and, you know, meticulously like um, you have to add like sound effects every single time you analyze an artifact like bam <laughs> you know, or, or something. And but. sifting through all the dirt. Yeah. Water it, screening. Oh yeah, it, exactly. But yeah, <laughs> but yes, archaeology isn't exactly, um, you know, punching bad guys in the face to try to like, you know, find just this one artifact that just so it happens to be conveniently placed out in the open somewhere. So, yeah, not quite exactly what we do. But, you know, I mean, they're, they're fun action and, and adventure films, but definitely don't really portray mm -hmm. um, the world of archaeology very well at all. I agree with you. So, <laughs> all right. Very cool. Not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have just a couple more questions uh, for you, okay. Hannah, and we're going to kind of sort of start wrapping up on uh, a little bit more of a serious note now. And uh, I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give young people or, you know, maybe just even anyone for that matter who may be seeking to make a career in archaeology? Uh, volunteering. Volunteering mm -hmm. and getting as much experience as possible is uh, definitely the best way to really figure out what you're doing and figure out if you have a passion and love for it. Uh, even if it's just as a hobby, it's again, volunteers are an invaluable resource that we honestly could not get on without. And it really gives you a lot of wonderful hands-on experience and you can get your foot in the door. And uh, like my experience, I know several of my friends have had the same experience of it uh, helps introduce you to the right people to where you can either get hired at the same place or you can make connections and network for later down the line. Uh, and I know what also helped me was I volunteered um, and being in a university definitely helped with this, but in different labs. So you really get the experience of learning from different people and you get to learn the best from each different um, archeologist and try to uh, learn different things. So you're not as one on a single track. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, museums, 
movies, documentaries. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge out there with technology. So um, having that kind of um, bolster your experience is always um, very nice. Yep, absolutely. Right on. All right. So I got one last question for you. And this is a pretty big one too, this final question. And that is, what can the general public do to help protect archaeological sites? Ah, that is a big one. <laughs> um, I feel like education is very important. So um, mm -hmm. really uh, learning more about the local sites and the history of where you are and uh, really spreading that knowledge and trying to educate others about it uh, so that they know the significance of it and why these sites need to be preserved and advocated for when the occasion arises. Um, so, uh, yeah, the dissemination of knowledge and, um, again, circling back to volunteering when it's necessary or needed um, and actually putting in the hands-on work, I guess. But, yeah, uh, really learning about these sites and passing on the knowledge is uh, very important and helps people see the value and why we try to protect them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Again, it kind of takes it goes along with that idea of uh, ownership. You know, it's this is their mm -hmm. cultural heritage, too. So it's just, uh, you know, them them putting into it, taking ownership of it, protecting it, passing it on to, uh, you know, future generations. Uh, and again, I think this is another first to come up on on the podcast, too, Hannah. So, <laughs> so yeah, so lot, lots of firsts in this episode, uh, uh, for sure. <laughs> But all right, well, Hannah, that, that's it. That's all uh, 15 questions uh, wrapped up. Um, you know, I, I want to thank you very much for, for taking the time uh, for joining me today. I mean, I know you're kind of sort of starting to draw near the end of your uh, master's degree program. So things are starting to pick up uh, quite a bit, I'm sure. But yeah, you know, it's just uh, it's great to, you know, reconnect with you. I'm glad to hear that, you know, you're doing well. We certainly miss you at SEAC, but, you know, we're glad that you're, uh, you know, on to, uh, you know, the next step in your career. So yeah, thanks so much for taking time for being here and sharing all this with myself and the listeners. You know, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. And especially I heard about your podcast way back when I started at CX. So this is very exciting for me. So thank you. Yeah. Long time coming uh, for sure. <laughs> So, all right, everyone, that's our show for today. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at NPSSEAC. That is at N-P-S-S-E-A-C. And be on the lookout for more episodes of Fitching Questions with Archaeologist dropping at the first of every single month. And please remember that since we work for the government, we spell archaeology without the A and the E, so it's just a little bit different when you read it in the title. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I'm Josh Guerrero, and I'll see you in the next episode.